Are psychic powers real? Equinox examines the apparent mysteries of psychics past and present. Kate, Maggie. Victoria mediums asked us to believe that spirits produced miraculous phenomena in the seance room. In this century, many have claimed powers of telepathy or the ability to influence objects with nothing more than the power of their minds. If somebody could genuinely demonstrate thought transfer and psychokinesis that you could move objects by the power of thought, that would be bringing to light an entire new field of physics. And you get a Nobel Prize for that. The powers do not exist. And I say that both from the point of view of hands-on experience in testing many, many people, and also from the point of view of science. Nothing has been found. Anecdotal stories, all kinds of almost proofs. But that's like being almost pregnant. It doesn't count. But a significant number of people believe that psychic powers do exist. Television programs such as Beyond Belief claim to investigate the paranormal. But are they just exploiting our appetite for supernatural wonders? And this is not an illusion. The metal is giving away and there is no heat produced. And if the baffling phenomena such as spoon bending presented on these shows are not psychic, how can they be explained? It's one of the few occasions when the phrase, it's getting softer, is good news. <laughs> yeah. Look, look at it. It's really, it's almost, look at it. It's there. Ah. Tonight, Equinox explores the secrets of the psychics. Am I going to move house during the next uh, year? <laughs> At the Metaphysical and Psychic Research Society, a group of psychic healers are conducting a table turning session. Oh. Am I going to move within five miles? The movements of the table indicate answers to questions. Within ten miles. Clockwise for yes and anti-clockwise for no. You notice the fingers are sliding across the table and not pushing the table at all. Well, if we try to push it, it would stop and it wouldn't work. I might be a grandmother by next year. Good. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Granny. <laughs> the table moves by kinetic energy, which is produced by the whole group. It's um, a form of energy, a mental energy. All kinetic energy stems from the, from the brain itself. The group gathers for both public healing sessions and for private meetings like this one. As well as turning tables, they also sit together in this room in the dark to contact the spirit world. The meeting is a serious meeting to, yeah. to study and develop both the healing, uh, healing, healing abilities and uh, our psychic abilities. First of all, we, we just come together and we, we, our, our thoughts become collective and very gradually the consciousness is, is relaxed, it becomes very relaxed. And sometimes a person can see things in front of them, sense things in front of them. You, you can't say you consciously sense them, but you psychically sense them. In the main, most of the contact we have are spirits that have, of, um, of our ancestors that have been mm. in different incarnations, but they are genetically connected. We call them spirit companions uh, because they do come and teach us a lot of things. There is one person that, that came to us some while ago and his name was Eddie Burkett. Oh, yeah. And Eddie was a woodsman and what he does, he comes and teaches us about herbs, what mushrooms grow up trees and what flowers to pick for certain healing, for curative effects. Uh, I think one of the other um, phenomena that, that is amazing is, is when you feel a solid object which you know isn't a material object. Uh, for example, as I felt the other week, a, a dog, um, which totally surprised me. Oh, well, basically it is a dog, that, a spirit dog that's been coming now for a little while. 
Norman's group sincerely believe that they have direct contact with the spirit world. Yet most observers over the years have been skeptical that such communication exists because of the lack of scientific evidence. It wasn't until the last century that anyone tried communicating with the dead through mediums and dark seances. This became known as spiritualism. It was started almost by accident only 150 years ago in the little town of Hydesville, New York, by two young girls. They were called Kate and Maggie Fox, and they weren't in touch with spirits. They were playing tricks in the dark. They made rapping noises by bouncing fruit on a string and cracking their toe joints on the bedboards. Maggie? The house was supposed to be haunted, and Mrs. Fox thought that the strange phenomena might be communications from the other side. The mother took it very seriously since the telegraph was in the, had just been invented, and it was talk about a spiritual telegraph. Girls, are you awake? We heard noises. Was it you girls? No, Papa. When news leaked out, the Fox's house was besieged by people fascinated by the possibility of communicating with the dead. Led on by their elder sister, who quickly saw where a buck was to be made, Kate and Maggie began their careers as the first spirit mediums. To begin with, the spirits would rap twice for yes and once for no. Then they learned to spell. They would sometimes recite the alphabet, A, B, C, and go through the whole alphabet to wait till a rap came. Let's say it came at B. Then they'd start again, go through the alphabet, and another rap, and then they'd record that next letter. Believe it or not, people even try to write whole books this way. That's a long, drawn-out way of doing it. Gradually, the spirits became more sophisticated, spelling out words by guiding the hands of sitters at seances, or answering questions by tipping a table this way or that. The great British scientist Michael Faraday discovered that this was not the work of spirits, but of unconscious muscular movements, now known as idiomotor action. You place your fingers on the edge of the table without realizing it, you can be pushing, you can be pulling in different directions. Only very small forces, but enough to move a glass or perhaps make a table tilt. There are angels the faithful, however, took such wonders as evidence that they were in touch with those in the afterlife, as spiritualism grew into a mass religion. Angels, angels Only two years after the Fox sisters had first heard the rappings, in 1850, there were more than 100 mediums in New York City, and there were 50 spiritualist circles in Philadelphia. And a decade after that, there were millions of believers in America and also in Europe. The medium took center stage, a rare job opportunity for women at the time. The spirits now began to speak, perhaps through a spirit trumpet, and to produce ever more unlikely phenomena. What we're talking about here is mystical stuff, I mean immortality, life after death and what was produced was, you know, trumpets blowing, mouth organs and tables lifting, I mean, you know, cr crass, crass bass stuff. Is that you, John? The skills of the medium had less to do with conjuring spirits than conjuring John? tricks. People had great reaching rods, they had sort of telescopic rods in which they could jingle bells at many yards distance. They had lengths of cotton set up, for, you know, they had, they had the, the, the consulting rooms arranged for, for trickery. I am here. Do you have a message for anyone here, John? I have a message from Beatrice. Yes, my Beatrice. I love you, Alfred. Take care. 
to the vast majority of the people who went to these seances, the one thing that they wanted above all else was to be able to believe that there really was life after death, that they really would be able to get in touch with their departed loved ones. And so and this incredibly flimsy evidence would actually be taken as being very, very strong proof by these people. For the mediums, it was a lucrative business. But to keep the faithful interested, they, or rather the spirits, had to learn new tricks. To keep the faithful interested, they, or rather the spirits, had to learn new tricks. Messages from beyond now began to arrive, in writing. And the most celebrated spirit writing medium was an American, Henry Slade. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Slade arrived in London in 1876, hoping Please to exploit a rich new market with the proof he claimed to offer of communication with the dead. Some were skeptical. You have a question? Two young yes. medical students set out to expose him. Keep it in your mind. Slade's speciality was producing spirit messages on slates of the kind that children would work on at school. He would first show that the slates were blank. Place your hands upon the slate. Mysterious sounds of writing would be heard, and then, as if by divine means, a message would appear, supposedly from the spirit of Slade's late wife. This trick, the message is prepared beforehand, but disguised with a false flap. When the two slates are placed together, the flap drops onto the slate opposite, and the writing is revealed. I want you to place these slates above your head, and then think of that question. What are you doing? You are an imposter, sir. Give me those back! Slade was arrested for fraud, and his trial at the Old Bailey was the talk of London for some weeks. He narrowly escaped jail, but his case had revealed deep divisions among scientists over the authenticity of spiritualism. Charles Darwin contributed the substantial sum of ten pounds towards the prosecution. But Alfred Russell Wallace, who had developed the theory of evolution alongside Darwin, was a key witness for Slade's defence. It was a perfect example of the clash between science and religion in the late 19th century. When Darwin came along with his radical theory of uh, survival of the fittest and evolution, uh, that was rather a blow to the religionists. Of course, they felt that their belief in the literal truth of the Bible was being challenged, and indeed it was. So they gave up their religion, but they wanted something else in its place. They were looking for something that's con more consistent with the new scientism, as it was called at that time. And when spiritualism come along, and a spiritualist said, look, we don't ask you to believe on faith anymore. We we're going to give you scientific evidence. We're going to give material proof. Mediums were quick to supply the evidence that the scientists were looking for in the form of a mysterious new substance from the spirit realm. It was called ectoplasm. It was a very good and scientific sounding word and everybody embraced it immediately. And this was a time when the most extraordinary scientific opening up, if you like, was going on. The Curies were discovering radioactivity and um, Röntgen had just discovered X-rays. But I mean, if you can have X-rays, why not ectoplasm? A much less worrying sort of phenomenon. But I think the vast majority of the people in science at that time were quite receptive. I mean, you look back, Barrett, Brooks, William James, all these people who were progressive thinkers at the time, you know, dabbled in these areas. Some of them, like H.G. Wells and others, dabbled even in occultism. Uh, this was much more respectable in those days. Uh, and it was really considered a more secular way of seeing these phenomena. Ectoplasm bore a striking resemblance to muslin. It tended to appear only after the medium had been out of sight for a while in a so-called spirit cabinet, a convenient curtain or screen behind which to prepare such spirit phenomena. 
The term ectoplasm had been coined by the Nobel Prize winning physiologist Charles Richet. His star subject was the flamboyant medium Eusapia Palladino. Richet conducted an investigation of Eusapia at his cottage in the south of France. He was convinced that Eusapia's phenomena were produced by spirit hands formed from ectoplasm. This contrasted with the theory of a famous Italian scientist who was sure that the phenomena emanated from pure sex energy and were even accompanied by orgasms. She would uh, moil and toil and groan and finally some physical manifestation would take place tables would rise, um, bells would ring, melons would be thrown, I mean, <laughs> you name it, she did it. Richet persisted in his theory that these effects were produced by ectoplasmic hands, though they seemed human enough, and they could feel painfully real. Palladino was very well known for being able to skillfully substitute one hand or one foot for another. So she would ask investigators on either side of her to hold onto her hands to place their feet on top of her feet so they had control of her. But in the semi-darkness, she was able to free one of her hands to do its spirit business, while the sitters were convinced they had control of both of them. Eusapia was just as good at slipping a foot out of this so-called control. She had her own table made from light wood, which she could lift by getting a foot under the table's leg, and she was frequently exposed in such trickery. Other effects might be produced by an accomplice. But Richet couldn't believe that such an ill-educated woman could be deceiving him. The believers are so purposefully blind when they want to be. They believed in Palladino because she was an ignorant Italian peasant, and that's an expression they used frequently. She was a very cunning Italian peasant. Lots of the early investigators of paranormal claims felt that just because they were eminent scientists, they couldn't be fooled. They were professional observers. They couldn't be fooled. Lots of conjurers will actually argue that they are easier to fool than children because of the logical way in which they think, because of the sequential nature of their thought processes. Having produced ectoplasmic body parts, mediums then tried full-form materializations. These pictures of the medium Eva Carrière were probably more convincing in the early innocent days of photography than they are today. She produced quite a number of heads which are clearly folded and flat. She also produced a full form materialization that she called Dawes Mika, which had a rather neat little black beard and specks and a sort of lab coat. And he too is extremely flat. Ava often performed in the nude, which perhaps distracted from Dawes Mika's flatness. His face was later shown to be a magazine photograph of the King of Bulgaria. Before long, materializations became much more lifelike. Once inside her cabinet, the medium would apparently be securely tied and go into a trance. After a while, a spirit would emerge. It moved, it breathed, it might even give you a kiss or shake hands. In fact, it looked for all the world like someone dressed up as a ghost. But the faithful wanted to believe that the spirits were genuine. It looked like a ghost, it talked like a ghost, uh, or a re dead relative, you know, it seemed reasonable to think it might be a dead relative. There were occasions when uh, the spirit form was grabbed and indeed identified as the medium. Um, what would typically happen then is that the other sitters would take great exception to the fact that the, uh, the spirit had been grabbed. This was definitely not the thing to do in a Victorian seance. It was against the rules. And it was even alleged that this would actually kill the medium, which in fact it never did. Um, but the, uh, 
the spirit form would then be hustled back behind the curtain and then five minutes later the somewhat dishevelled medium would apparently come out of her trance and claim to have no knowledge of what had taken place. With one exception, all practising mediums were exposed uh, as frauds or else quite often confessed. This diminished neither the popularity of spiritualism nor the controversy over its supernatural claims. So Scientific American magazine decided to put an end to the debate once and for all. They offered a $5,000 prize to anyone who could prove a genuine psychic phenomenon. But it takes a trickster to spot a trickster. And to win the prize, mediums would have to convince the greatest illusionist and skeptic of them all. Harry Houdini. Walter. When Scientific American magazine offered a $5,000 prize to anyone who could prove a genuine psychic phenomenon, a well-to-do doctor's wife from Boston, Massachusetts, came very close to winning it. Marjorie Crandon claimed to be in touch with the spirit of her dead brother, Walter, who could apparently make objects fly around the room and even ring an electric bell. If you're here with us, Walter, ring the bell. Marjorie's charming middle-class persona masked one of the cleverest and most manipulative mediums of her age. When Houdini arrived to investigate for Scientific American, Marjorie realized that her reputation was on the line. Amos Houdin, he's here. He's here in the room with us. He's right beside me, Walter. Walter, ring the bell for him. Huh? <sighs> Over a long career, Marjorie Crandon produced some of the most extraordinary seance phenomena ever witnessed, from pure ectoplasm to weird spirit hands. Houdini later explained how he had placed the box containing the electric bell that Walter liked Walter. to ring beneath his chair. Ring for him. Ring. He had also bound up his lower Walter. leg for several hours before the seance to make it sensitive. Press your leg hard against mine so that you can tell that it's still there. Very well. Closer. Sure enough, Closer. Houdini felt Marjorie's leg slipping past his. Listen, Houdini. I have a message. Have Mr. Bird fetch me pencil and slate. More control. Now you have both my hands and both my feet. The megaphone is in the air. Have Houdini tell me where to throw it. Towards me. Okay, here we are. Uh, perhaps we could uh, arrange the seats the way they were yesterday, please. Having discovered how Marjorie rang the electric bell, Houdini yes, sneaked back into the sales room the following day to see if he could work out how Marjorie had done her other tricks. How, uh, she managed to get the cabinet to go Starting back. with the toppling spirit cabinet. Of course, it would be easier to do if you had both hands free. Yeah, but you had hold of one of her hands. Exactly. I had hold of one of her hands. Mr. Bird had hold of the other. But then Mr. Bird had to leave the room at one point, which meant that she had her other hand free. <laughs> we also have to establish how this came to be on the floor beneath my feet. Now. It was not possible for her to throw it on the floor because by the time it hit the floor... You had hold of both of her hands. Exactly. So this is how I think she did it. The megaphone was somewhere hereabouts on the floor. Let's say it was just here. Yes. She has one free hand, but she also has one free foot. Yes. She tips the cabinet back with her hand and places her foot underneath the cabinet. Then she takes hold of the megaphone and places it on her head. Makes me look like a dunce, yeah? <laughs> then she gives me both her hands. At this point, she flicks the cabinet over with her foot. Yeah. Then she brings both feet round, so I have both her feet with my foot and both hands in my hand. Uh. 
brilliant, isn't it? Marjorie, you know, was a fraud. There's no doubt about it. Anyway, she didn't win the 5,000 bucks. The tricks of the early medium seem so obvious a hundred years after the fact. Could anyone be fooled today? Take your seat. Thank you so much. This footage is of an experimental seance conducted in 1997 by Dr. Richard Wiseman of the University of Hertfordshire with a group of open-minded volunteers. Claire. The hands and ankles of the actor who is playing the part of the medium are first tied to his chair by the sitters themselves. Claire, if I can ask you just to, uh, to do that. Excellent. On the table, there is a selection of typical spiritualist paraphernalia, including a rattle, a bell, a megaphone, and an accordion. This is an experiment. I'll let Richard leave. We are going to be plunged in a minute when I give the signal into total darkness. But once it goes dark, we're going to try and focus our energy and move the objects. OK, can we have the lights dimmed to black? The lights go down and the room is now in complete darkness. All the sitters can see so are can some see, luminous dots painted on the various objects on the table. But using special cameras which can film in the dark, we can see the seance as if it's brightly lit. And later, the volunteers were able to see what had happened. So this is how you all looked. We're going to try and channel the energy, because we're a group, into the objects one at a time on the table to see what happens. But to make sure we stay as a group and act as a group, I want us actually to breathe as a group. So we're going to be breathing in through our nose for a count of three, and out for five through the mouth. It will also help to clear our thoughts. You have to think of nothing else just the objects on the table. And now, the trickery and begins. Out. Breathe in. So we should be feeling nice and calm and relaxed. There are a number of objects on the table that you've all had a chance to look at. There was a ball, there was an accordion, a shaker, a bell. I want us to all concentrate on one image. Concentrate on the shaker. He's reached under the chair now and picked up what's called a reaching rod, which is an extendable rod. In for three. Out for five. Work together as a group. Feel the person's energy next to you. Concentrate only on the shaker. Keep concentrating on it. Concentrate only on the shaker. That's very good. Keep it going. Keep the breathing going. Don't panic. It's all right. Just keep the breathing. Your heartbeat will rise, but it's all right if you just keep breathing. Keep the grip of the person next to you. If you feel unsure, close your eyes for a moment. The panic will pass, but it's all right. You're doing very well. It's only energy. Just breathe in for three. Out for five. Just the shaker. Imagine the shaker. That's good. Just visualize the shaker. Keep it on the shaker. That's very good. That's all right. You've done Our sitters' well. perceptions of what had gone on were interestingly at variance with what actually the happened. The shaker. That's very good. That's all right. Claire, there's quite a lot of movement next to you on that. You didn't suspect no, anything? I didn't feel anything. Nothing. It makes you feel really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> now, in your mind's eye, Marilyn, whilst the sitters were distracted by the rattle, the medium's accomplice had made his entrance. And remember, it's still completely dark. We can see you picking up the straw hat. That's it, Marilyn. You're bringing it back towards yourself. You're taking up to your. That's right, Marilyn. And you're going to put it on your head now. <laughs> You feel it? It's a strong People feeling. were startled by the seance effects, even though they were expecting things to happen. The ideas you were getting in your head were actually very complicated to try and solve it, but it was also simple. It was just yeah. the easiest thing in the world. Keep the focus on the ball. Keep the focus on the ball. Try and lift the ball. It's all right, Marilyn. Keep breathing. In for three. Out. Most people seem to think that the temperature had gone down in the studio. It's getting very cold in here. The energy is very, very powerful. This was pure suggestion. The air conditioning remained constant throughout the session. So it really did yeah, feel like yeah, a change in the temperature. Yeah. I, I, yeah, definitely. It was cold. It was cold, yeah. <laughs> it was. Is everyone OK? Wow! <laughs> no one suspected the most obvious culprit, Richard, the medium himself. Well, what role did Richard play in it all? Well, he wasn't moving right. anything around. I don't no. think like, he's just... No, so you didn't, you didn't suspect him? No, no. no. Why, why didn't you suspect him? 
He's tied to the chair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. And you, his voice is coming from place. permanent position. Yeah, his yeah. voice is coming from the same spot all the time. So it wasn't okay. like if it moved and it was so dark, you'd, you'd know yeah. it. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. So you could you know locate I mean? sound could, in the dark. Yeah, Richard Wiseman's experiment was part of his work as one of a number of scientists with an interest in researching the psychic phenomena that so many people are convinced exist. Given that 50 to 60 percent of the population believes in the paranormal and something like 30 percent say they've experienced it, we have some kind of obligation in science to find out why. It was 70 years ago at Duke University, North Carolina, that attempts to quantify psychic phenomena under controlled conditions began, and they've been plagued with controversy ever since. The, the science of parapsychology was the brainchild of Joseph Banks Rhine, a biologist with an interest in things spiritual. A visit to the medium Marjorie Crandon had convinced him that the study of psychic phenomena should be brought away from the fakery of the seance room and into the laboratory. But Ryan's first experiments in the field were an embarrassing dead end, investigating the psychic abilities of a performing horse called Lady Wonder. He concluded that the horse actually was reading minds. It was not an auspicious beginning for him and his program of parapsychology. And it wasn't until the mid-1930s that he got the serious attention of the Paris of the scientific community again. Ryan's book, Extrasensory Perception, a term he invented, was based on far more convincing experiments and had an enormous impact. Oh, Sarah, so nice to see you again. Please, take a seat. Let's buzz through to George and let him know we're ready. Using ordinary subjects and not self-proclaimed mediums, Ryan tried to amass statistical evidence for the existence of telepathy. Ready? Okay, let's begin. It was in Ryan's laboratory that Xena cards were developed, comprising five symbols, star, circle, cross, wavy lines, and square. Cross. One experimental subject, the sender, would pick a card and the other, the receiver, who might be in another room, had to try and guess which one it was. Square? It was a good clearing up job. But of course what he ended up doing was really, really boring experiments in which people sat hour after hour going square, circle, circle, wavy lines, um, and getting marginally significant results, which we can now look back at and think, well, you know, there were lots and lots of problems with these, um, and they, they did not really provide believable evidence. Wavy line. Two of Ryan's subjects, however, achieved far more than marginally significant results. George Zirkel and Sarah Owenby sometimes scored as many as 23 out of 25 correct answers. Star. Ryan took this as strong evidence. But in 1938, a conjuring magazine suggested that J.B. Ryan might have been hoodwinked. There are any number of ways that George and Sarah could have been communicating that didn't need ESP. One method involves two people practicing counting together at the same speed. Cross. As soon as an answer is called out, the accomplices start counting. If the bell rings after four beats, a square is being sent. Square? Cheating, sometimes by subjects and sometimes by the experimenters, continue to be a problem for parapsychology. I think parapsychology has a particular problem with fraud, in the sense that all scientists have some fraud, but they can cope with it. A little bit of fraud here and there, which is almost inevitable, doesn't really matter because in almost any other science you can look for replication. And if somebody else can repeat the result, it doesn't really matter if the first person cheated. And if they can't, well, everybody will realize they can't, and the, and the cheater will be, will be shown up. The problem in parapsychology is that we haven't got good replicable phenomena at all. So it could be that all we have are the little bits of fraud and the little bits of errors and nothing else. In other words, all the phenomena are the noise, if you like, which other sciences can get rid of, and we can't. Parapsychologists have been clamoring to be recognized as legitimate science, and they still haven't quite made it. Uh, most of the scientific community still does not accept them. It may very well be that some of the things that today would seem magical will one day 
become embraced within science. But the vast majority of things that we would think of as magical never will. The trick is, of course, to find out which they are, and you've got to do true science to, to do that. The tape that you're about to see consists of a series of episodes suggestive of psychokinesis. In pursuit of true science, two scientists from the McDonnell Laboratory for Psychical Research investigated two young men who claimed to have psychic powers. The subjects in these experiments are two men of about 21, M.E. and S.S., addressed on the soundtrack as Mike and Steve. The scientists did not claim that the tape provided incontrovertible evidence of psychokinesis, or PK, but they still thought that it had much to offer. The object in front of Steve's hands is a small clock, and he's attempting to move it via PK. Steve had reported success at these kinds of efforts before coming to research sessions, and here you'll see him successfully induce such movements. Steve's full name is Steve Shaw, though he's now adopted the stage name Banachek, because Steve is not a psychic, he's a conjurer. The way that I normally make something move is, is pretty convincing. But this particular time, I simply had a piece of thread, a broken piece of thread, and uh, I had wrapped it around one finger and around the other and made it move forward. And as it moves forward, you see me going like this, but then I want to make it come back towards me. So I lift up over it, and I come back. So to me, it's obvious you have a thread. But why was Steve trying to fool the scientists? His aim, along with the other so-called psychic Mike Edwards, was to prove how easily magicians can convince scientists that they have paranormal powers. The hoax was orchestrated by magician and arch-skeptic James Randi. They went into the laboratory over a period of about three and a half years. Totally convinced the scientists there that they had psychic powers, and they would report to me after each session as to what they had done. And I said to the kids, if they ever ask you, was that a trick or are you doing tricks, you must immediately say, Yes, these are tricks, and we were sent here by James Randi to test your ability to detect us. They were never asked. And they asked me if I could affect a video camera. So what I did was I simply thought about it for a few seconds and said, I can give it a try. So I put my hand up to my head, and I concentrated on the camera. And sure enough, two flashes appeared on the film. All I had simply done was, when I brought my head on in, I'd taken my left hand, brought it up around, and I turned the camera on and off very quickly. Of course, I hadn't noticed this because they were actually watching in the monitors, which were sitting off to the side. Watch carefully at times... But the scientists chose a far-out explanation rather than the most obvious one. Steve's method is one of telling his subconscious mind what it is he'd like to have happen, then ridding his conscious mind of thoughts so that his subconscious mind can perform the task. The phenomenon here resemble what happens when the power to a video camera is briefly cut. They want to believe so bad that they let you get away with everything. They basically want to document it and show it to the rest of the world. What they're trying to do is show their own beliefs to the rest of the world as opposed to, to really proving it to the world. In the 1980s, the American media began to take an interest in James Heydrich a young man of remarkable physical prowess who also claimed to have psychic powers. Heydrich could apparently make a pencil spin without touching it, make a dollar bill turn on a pin under an upturned fish tank, or riffle the pages of a telephone directory. Danny Corum, a professional magician turned investigative journalist, was suspicious. He persuaded Heydrich to take part in a TV documentary. He uh, fooled millions of people here in this country. And then scientists. Scientists took him into the University of Utah. Heydrich had built up a cult-like following in Salt Lake City with a peculiar mix of martial arts and the paranormal. He would astonish his young students by seeming to make heavy punch bags in his gym swing without touching them. It only worked at a certain time of day. See, it was an old building had kind of a corrugated metal roof. Okay, so about three o'clock in the afternoon, roof would start to heat up. But when it would heat up, it would expand and shift. And then he says, uh, I want you to start imagining that you, the building's starting to crack, to rotate. And you'd hear these popping sounds. And then because the, ro the, the roof 
is, you know, expanding. It, it would cause the gym bags, which were suspended from the ceiling, to start to sway. It was very impressive. It was very impressive. One by one, Corum began to work out how Heydrich's feats were done. Most of them depended on an extraordinary ability to exhale a strong stream of breath without it showing on his face or lips. It was strong enough even to pass through any tiny gaps between the fish tank and the table. He had developed the page-turning effect while serving a prison sentence, using the Bible to impress fellow inmates. And he would tell the prisoners, if you will pray with me, uh, the Holy Spirit will cause the pages of the Bible to turn. This is blasphemous. And he would actually blow on the pages. And a lot of times he'd let the inmate think that they were causing you know, the pages to turn. Heydrich became confused when he saw Coram replicating his own psychic phenomena, and even thought that Coram might have genuine powers. The toughest part, though, was exposing the tricks without causing him to become hostile because he was a very dangerous individual. Realizing that he had been found out, Heydrich agreed to make a full confession on camera. I'm not going like that because that can be seen. I am taking air from inside and causing it to come out in a way to where nothing here shows. My whole idea behind this in the first place was to see how dumb America was, how dumb the world is. In our age, it's arguable that one man has had more influence on the public's belief in psychic powers than any other. Uri Geller seemed to bring miracles into the television studio and became the first psychic superstar. He told us he could bend metal with the power of his mind, and most of us believed him. The psychic superstar of the 70s, Uri Geller, is back. He's an ideal subject for Channel 5's Fame and Fortune, the Hello magazine of television. His claim to be able to bend spoons with the power of his mind is still his trademark and has helped to make him a very wealthy man. This is not an illusion. I mean, it, it is real. The, the metal is giving away. I feel it cracking. Melt. 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 See, it's very, very soft now. It's almost like plastic. Look, unfortunately, this is a trademark that stuck to me. <laughs> and every time a paper writes something about me, and they always say, Uri Geller, the spoon bender. If a man could do this, then no engineering structure made from metal was safe. He shows quite good psychic perceptual ability, not the best we've ever seen, but quite good. As far as I'm aware, from my observation, Geller has no psychic ability whatsoever. However, he's a very clever, well-practiced magician. His big break came in 1973. Ladies and gentlemen, Uri Geller. The 26-year-old Israeli, who David Dimbleby told us had baffled American scientists, astonished the nation. He broke a fork. It's, look, it's like it's becoming like plastic. It's breaking. It's breaking. It's breaking. It's breaking. You, you can if, look. It's it, it's very. <laughs> On the same show, Geller duplicated a drawing which had been sealed in an envelope. Wow. And started a number of apparently broken watches. Okay, no, I I tried my best. Oh, wait, it's, it's moving. It's moving. Oh, it is. It's working. He convinced experts and audience alike that supernatural powers were at work. It was a seminal performance, establishing a psychic repertoire that has changed little over the years. And it released a tidal wave of belief in the paranormal. The editor of the Daily Mirror in the 70s, Mike Malloy, remembers Geller's press value. Geller was a big story big international story and very acute businessman one of the things he offered to do was stop Big Ben he said that uh, I can stop Big Ben for you but uh, I want a million pounds to do this and an aircraft waiting to fly me out of the country 
But the image Mike Malloy remembers most vividly is of Geller bending a spoon in his office. It just bent away, just like a finger bending. It was quite extraordinary. Um, and everyone kind of looked and went, Whoa, you know, sort of, because it was quite spooky. Malloy was convinced by Geller's powers and dined out on this story until he met Tommy Cooper, who astonished him with a series of sleight-of-hand tricks. What I realised then, of course, is that a really good conjurer with someone with that skill does perform the impossible in front of your eyes. So, I, that's an open verdict. I mean, what I, I, I saw Yuri Geller do was remarkable, um, and I had no, time, no reason to doubt it, but perhaps he's just a brilliant conjurer after all. You can all do this yourself. You can all do this yourself. It's an optical illusion. You see, you get the spoon like this, and you just grip the end of it like this, and you do that, and you give the impression of bending the spoon. You can do it yourself. It just looks just like you're bending the spoon. <laughs> Conjurers can duplicate all of the Geller repertoire. What they fail miserably to do, claims Geller, is demonstrate these feats under laboratory conditions. But can he? Uri Geller's interactive psychic city, his chic website on the internet, presents a collection of reports which seem to give scientific credence to his psychic abilities. But do they? One report is by the mathematician John Taylor, who met Geller on the Dimbleby talk-in, and was clearly caught up in the excitement of the moment. Yes, I believe this process. I believe that you actually broke the fork here and now. Yes. Let's find out, first of all, what caused this. Well, Geller visited Taylor at King's College and impressed him greatly. But, but later, Taylor established proper experimental controls and became far more skeptical. Two years after the Dimbleby appearance, Geller came into my lab. He had an informal look round. Didn't try anything, he just looked round. And then he came back some weeks later for about an hour and a half and he tried to bend the pieces of metal that we had set up. Nothing happened. Nothing at all. And at that point, we said, could you come back later? He never reappeared. And he's never reappeared since. I found nobody who could demonstrate any psychic powers under the conditions that I would say were 100%. Many of the reports on Geller's website are not formal scientific tests. In fact, only one published paper was presented for peer review. It was from the Stanford Research Institute, the SRI, and although its referees expressed strong doubts, the prestigious journal Nature printed it anyway, to show how the fringe science of parapsychology was being taken seriously at such a reputable institute. They would put me in a Geller often refers to being tested at the SRI. His confidence and stridency here with Andrew Neal give the impression that the tests were a success. So I've been validated that's how I feel. Nature magazine, the most prestigious magazine in the world, Big ran a 15-page paper about me. But the editorial in Nature warned that details of the SRI experiments were disconcertingly vague. The authors of the Nature report were Russell Targ and Hal Puthoff. And their principal experiments on metal bending were far from successful. After five weeks of working with him in the laboratory, we were unsuccessful in demonstrating or eliciting anything that looked like scientific evidence for metal bending under laboratory conditions. Ray Hyman is a psychologist from the University of Oregon and an accomplished magician. He was asked by the US Defense Department to go to the SRI and observe Geller for a day. I saw what I thought was just a, 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 a rather crude trickster in terms of technique, in terms of psychology, very superb. He could bend minds better than he could bend metal. George Lawrence was sent to the SRI by the Advanced Research Projects Agency in Washington, who felt they could not afford to dismiss the possibility of a psychic offensive in the Cold War. I was invited to SRI to see Uri Geller, to, to, to witness a demonstration. And in fact, Uri Geller bent my nail clipper. Ray Hyman remembers that Geller asked George to hold the clipper whilst he tried to bend it. He said, hold it in your hand, like that. And Geller then stood over George and went, mm, 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 
He couldn't bend it while it sat in the palm of my hand, and he stared at it and made his face get red. However, he said if he took it in his hand and, and communicated with it, that perhaps it would respond better to, to his efforts. So he did that, put it back in my hand, folded my hand over it, and said, let me try again. And when I unfolded my hand, sure enough, there was a slight curvature in the, in the file part. <laughs> That <laughs> somehow didn't convince me that that, that we ought to, uh, ought to ought to count on this as a as a way to uh, conduct warfare. No, <laughs> that that we ought to, uh, ought to ought to count on this as a as a way to uh, conduct warfare. No. <laughs> Ray Hyman pointed out that the nail clipper had been in Uri's possession for some time when he would have had the opportunity to bend it. Is it more likely that Uri's hands bent the clipper, or the power of his mind? Russell Targ, co-author of the Nature Report, still stands by its claims that Geller succeeded in duplicating drawings made at random in one room whilst Geller was in another. Critics charged that the tests were chaotic. Targ says it was controlled chaos. We could control the amount of chaos in the laboratory because it was our laboratory. When Geller is on stage, the observer has no control at all of what goes on. So we feel that there's not a lot of room for trickery in, in these really quite simple experiments. Psychologist David Marks published a detailed critique of the SRI report in The Psychology of the Psychic and thinks Targ's confidence in the reliability of the SRI drawing tests is ill-founded. They were appallingly controlled. Geller was left entirely unobserved inside this room. These days, or even in those days, any competent experimenter would have put a video camera on Geller and observed him at every second of the experiment and would have provided no loopholes. The Nature paper, I'm afraid, um, provides no evidence of Geller's claimed psychic powers whatsoever. Geller may have been tested by scientists but no one has managed to replicate the work carried out at the SRI, a fundamental principle in establishing scientific proof. The one thing we do know from um, all the experiments over the years in parapsychology is that if there is a phenomenon there, it is weak, variable, and very difficult to pin down. Whereas the superpsychics are claiming that they have a power that is more or less under their control and extremely powerful. And that just has never been shown in the laboratory at all. The scientists may have been unable to authenticate Geller's most famous talent, psychic spoon-bending. Conjurers, however, quickly spotted a rich source of new material for their box of tricks. But how did they manage to bend spoons without psychic powers? Self-confessed illusionist Ian Rowland explains just one of the many ways it can be done. Now this is by any standards a very unusual way to hold a spoon, but I condition people to see that this is how I hold it. Just let me see with nettle. I will then create some misdirection just for a split second, and what I will do is actually put a bend into the spoon. It doesn't take more than a fraction of a second to actually do that. And as soon as I've done that, I carry on back to this position. Now, people have already seen me holding the spoon like this, so they're not suspicious. And at this stage, we're going to the next phase of the trick, which is uh, what we call the pivot move, or the optical bend. You concentrate everybody's attention on this end, by the way you look, the way you hold the spoon, and you actually pivot it at this central point. And that gives an optical illusion as if it's bending further. So it looks a bit like this. It's bending more, it's going higher, it's going higher, it's going higher. Because I think you can do this. But that's just on a chat show which boasted one of Oprah Winfrey's yeah, early appearances, Geller demonstrated a spoon bend, which may or may not have been done with supernatural forces in the face of all known physical laws. It does, however, look awfully like the conjuring trick Ian Rowland sometimes uses. And I say, if you look at that spoon, it will carry on bending. See? And, she, and it still is bending slowly upwards. Nine times out of ten, people say, yeah, I, I can see it's actually bending a little bit more it's still. Bending. Holly, it's still yeah, bending it's still slow. is bending very slowly look upwards. Look. Some of them say they do it by genuine psychic powers, and maybe they do. When I do it, it's a trick. You pay your money, you take your choice. But it looks the same. But if it's not psychic, why hasn't anyone actually seen Geller bend a spoon with his hands? 
Well, in fact, a number of people say they have. One of them is Bob Cootie, who visited Geller at his home when he was researching a radio series and a book on the paranormal. He took the spoon and then said, well, I need to be near something metal. And he stepped to one side, and as he stepped over, he sort of pushed in and down. And then he turned the spoon and hid the bend behind his hand, and then began to rub the spoon and made it appear that it was then bending. And it was, I was, I was very startled and in a way shocked, and I was thinking, what? I mean, this was his house in front of his family, and you don't go into another man's house and call him a liar in front of his own wife and children. Yes, I'm just waiting for him to bring a teaspoon. Excuse me. Geller featured on the gotcha segment of Noel Edmonds' house party, but somehow discovered the hidden cameras. This was hailed as proof of his psychic powers. But before he rumbled Noel's plot, he performed some feats in a way that critics think is revealing. Look, you see, it's beginning. Oh, oh my God! <laughs> oh, it's unbelievable. See, it's bending upwards. At a restaurant table, Geller bent a spoon a little, and then the other diners started to take an interest. I, I didn't come to do a show here, but... Uh, How did you do that? With my, I'm doing it with my mind. It clearly seems to me as though he bent the spoon as he was standing up. Yes, of course. And then he walked over to one of the other diners and handed the spoon to her. And it's clear that the spoon is bent a lot more when it leaves his hand than when it went into his hands. And I wonder why he needed, with this light object like a spoon, to put it over and hold it in both hands, and why this suspicious move was made. Despite his reputation as a spoon bender, Geller is just as likely to make a piece of cutlery break, like this. It's a different effect, but is it caused by supernatural means? An easier way to create this effect would be to weaken the spoon beforehand by bending it back and forth to the point at which it's about to fracture. When the time comes, it would need only a little more manipulation to make it break. Is there any metallurgical difference between a spoon broken by repeated bending and this one allegedly broken psychically by Geller? The psychokinetic energy melts the molecular structure of the metal and breaks it. I managed to get hold of the spoon that uh, Geller had broken, the, the fracture surface of this, and I had this examined in a scanning electron microscope. And a fatigue fracture in a metal is very, very characteristic. And so when we looked at the spoons that uh, Geller had broken, we could see these fatigue striations in the fracture surface. And that was a clear indication that uh, he, he'd broken the spoon by having a sort of bending operation like that on it. He perhaps did that sort of bending off camera. <laughs> it's going, it's going, it's going, it's gone. There's nothing magical about that, that's straightforward metallurgy. <laughs> Low cycle. High strain fatigue. Before Geller, no psychic had bent a spoon. But the trick of being able to duplicate a hidden drawing has been known to conjurers for years, and there are dozens of methods described in books and journals available to the magic trade. There are trick pads, fake envelopes, you can even buy a hidden transmitter. <laughs> Ian Rowland's audience here do not know how this duplication is done. But not knowing how something is done does not automatically mean that it is paranormal. What is it? Oh, oh, my, oh my God! God. <laughs> <laughs> no. There are umpteen ways of going about it, and if you explain it all in detail, it would take more than time than you've got in this program. It can be done by trickery, and some people say they can do it by genuine psychic powers. If they're using genuine psychic powers, they are doing it the hard way. This, this drawing was done this afternoon. It was, then, and it was done behind a wall in one of the dressing rooms here. Um, and it was then sealed up like this. Very well sealed up, too. <laughs>
Geller's drawing duplications using telepathy on television look identical with the techniques used by conjurers. This in itself does not mean that he is using those same techniques, but neither does it tell us that he is doing anything different. He asks us to believe he is psychic simply because he says so. Conjurer James Randi has the reputation of being Geller's most persistent critic. When you finish your drawing, photograph it with your mind. He's taken a close look at Geller's performance of a drawing duplication filmed surreptitiously for Noel Edmonds' house party. Randi thinks he sees here something very similar to what conjurers call the peak. I'm not looking. Go ahead. He turns away like this and then immediately turns back and is facing her. I'm not looking. Go ahead. Keep it very simple. <laughs> Now I'm looking straight at you and I can see you clearly through the crack in my fingers. Tell me when you finished. And now I'm looking straight at the lens of the camera and I'm seeing the lens of the camera very plainly. Because I really got the image very, very strongly. Is it something like a little house? Oh, I can't believe it. Am I right? May I see it? I can't believe it. Yeah. There, exactly. Uri Geller caught the world's attention not only with the miracles he performs close up before your very eyes, but also with the so-called Geller effect, his apparent ability to influence objects such as watches at a distance, even in the homes of a TV audience. David Marks has a test in which he asks his non-psychic students to phone people at random and see whether they have an old, seemingly broken watch. We will telephone them ask them to do exactly the same thing that Geller does, we find that we get the same results. That in a certain percentage of cases, watches which have not worked for perhaps years will begin to tick again. And it's the act of holding these things in your hand and warming them up a bit that gets them ticking again. Ian Rowland discovered that these broadcast effects work even for the non-psychic. On a live TV program, he pretended to psychically wipe floppy disks in viewers' homes across the airwaves. And sure enough, three or four people phoned in to say that they had saved some data on the disk, they had checked it now, ever since I did my psychic zapping, and the, and the disk was now blank, you know, a psychic miracle. There's no trick, there's no method, but if you go on a live television program watched by the sorts of people who believe in psychic abilities and you tell them this is going to happen, people will phone in and say it's happened. Will you welcome, please, Uri Geller. Television is not a laboratory, and studios are designed for entertainment, not scientific investigation. When Uri Geller appeared on The Carson Show and was trying to divine which of these film cans had water in it, he was unaware that the show's producer had consulted magician James Randi. I'm having a hard time with you. Okay, I don't mean to be, Uri. I really no, don't. Just, just keep looking. Okay, let me rest a little, all right? All right. And the prop cabinet was kept closed and locked with a padlock. And Geller was not allowed to handle these things, which may, in my professional estimation, have some, some, some influence, may have had some influence somewhere along the line on whether or not the performance was a success. As it was, it was a dead loss for Mr. Geller. Brewery was telling me you, you, you don't feel, what, strong tonight? I don't Is feel that... strong. It's not... All tonight, right now, I'm feel I'm feeling being pressed, and then I can't. Well, I'm not trying to press you. I really not. Uh, you no, know, you're only I'm... telling me, well, will you try that or that? Well, I thought that was the idea of. Uh, <laughs> of uh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not trying to put you down. Once again, if if you'll uh, allow me to plug this myself, and the, the reason. Please, I After what seemed to be a quiet period in the 1980s, Geller has effected a comeback. This is a, this is a cover. These days, he's trying to make money from products which are supposed to have benefited from his powers. There's a crystal in here, which is this one. I've touched every crystal. I've touched. 50, Nine days. Fifty. Eleven. Eleven days. Fifty thousand crystals were held in my hand. Geller's slickly designed website advertises not only Uri Bear, psychically charged of course, but something called the Geller Edge. Uri wants to help your business. An apparent success story involves Geller dowsing for diamonds in the Solomon Islands for the Australian mining company Xanax. Its former chairman is quoted as gushing recently, 
I will never drill an oil well without asking Yuri Geller's advice first. So just how did Geller's unique powers help Xanax? John Shepard's company had a major shareholding in Xanax in the 1980s when he heard that they had hired Geller apparently for a fee of a quarter of a million US dollars. Apart from laughing, I was horrified. I certainly couldn't see how he could fly over islands and uh, locate gold deposits. And the results from the time he spent there you know, were all negative. And in fact, history now shows that uh, it was negative. But I've seen uh, on the internet his, his page, and it's a prominent part of his uh, promotion about the Solomon Islands experience. And clearly it was a failure. And I find it staggering that Geller can be using the Solomon Island uh, experience as a success story. It was certainly a psychic disaster. If these paranormal phenomena were real, and if somebody could genuinely demonstrate thought transference, psychokinesis, that you could move objects by the power of thought, that would be bringing to light an entire new field of physics. And you get a Nobel Prize for that. So what are these people doing, fooling around, doing stupid entertainment, doing television programs, when they could be uh, achieving the acclaim of scientists the, the world over? The reason, of course, is that they're not exploiting and using new physical forces. They're doing conjuring tricks. <laughs> Programs like Beyond Belief seem to feed an increasing appetite for all things paranormal as we approach the third millennium. We trusted presenter Sir David Frost to pin down Richard Nixon in his famous interviews with Tricky Dicky. Should Beyond Belief's 12 million viewers expect similar rigor in the investigation it boasts? Thank you very much. Hello, good evening and welcome to Beyond Belief the first ever live television investigation into the world of the paranormal. Endless numbers of programs are presented every week all around the world in every culture and every language that are pro-paranormal. And one of the reasons for that is producers and editors recognize an attractive story that they would like to be true because they recognize that the public would like it to be true as well. I'm actually communicating now with millions of people. Made but are the phenomena presented on these programs really beyond belief? They are often much less surprising if you don't assume a paranormal explanation. Which of these symbols would you pick as Uri Geller tries to broadcast the one he's thinking of to the audience at home? Really strongly passing it to you one more time. Well, this is a tense moment now for me and for... Forty-seven percent of people who called chose the star symbol. Oh. Hey! Elation and astonishment was displayed all around. We had witnessed live evidence of telepathy. Or had we? That... Well, that's Wait, I have to say... A much more banal explanation is also much more likely that the effect relied on a phenomenon which has been known to psychologists and indeed conjurers for many years. Anyway, there's, there's the, that is amazing. Thank you, Yuri. We've known from as long ago as 1939, a psychologist called Frederick Lund looked at which of the five symbols on the Xenopack were the most commonly chosen, and it's a star. Another effect that he picked up on was the fact that if you have an array of symbols, people tend not to pick the ones at the end. They tend not to pick the first one or the last one. Putting these two factors together, it was very fortunate for Yuri, I think, that he picked the star. Boris is going to place this hand over an article of their clothing. On Beyond Belief, we were assured that Russian so-called psychic Boris Tulchinsky could sense colours clairvoyantly. Uh, Orange. Is this performance really paranormal? Professional illusionists through the ages have done much more impressive things whilst blindfolded. Really paranormal. Professional illusionists through the ages have done much more impressive things whilst blindfolded. Put the blindfold on, like so. And now I'm going to do something that you should never try. Don't try this at home.
I bet many of you read the impression that you're actually driving behind this guy. There are various ways of performing feats whilst apparently blindfolded. Magicians keep the details to themselves, but most of them depend on a simple trick. Being able to see. JT is apparently an amazingly telepathic dog. JT the dog's telepathic talent was shown on the paranormal world of Paul McKenna in what was billed as a genuine experiment. JT could apparently tell when his owner decided to return home. To prove it, two cameras had filmed simultaneously, one on JT's owner Pam and one on the psychic dog. Incredibly, just eight seconds after Pam decides to start the six-mile journey home, JT moves to the window to wait for her. But psychologist Richard Wiseman, one of the guests on the show, found himself wondering whether the story served up to the viewers was as remarkable as it seemed. So he set up his own experiment. We filmed him continuously over a three-hour period and at one point we had the owner randomly think about returning home from the remote location. And yes indeed, JT was at the window at that point. What our videotape showed though was that JT was visiting the window about once every ten minutes. And so under those conditions it's not surprising he was there when his owner was thinking of returning home. Alright. Yes. Okay, this is perfect. He should give me something. What, what is this? Money. Money. Alright. Um, if the allegedly telepathic uh, abilities uh, Ronnie and Oren demonstrated on Beyond Belief are genuine, then they have succeeded where generations of parapsychologists have failed. But would anyone be so amazed if, instead, they were just a classic stage mind-reading act? Throughout the history of psychic research, there have been pairs of people who say they can communicate uh, via telepathy. And the problem with testing those is that there is a large literature written by magicians on ways of faking that. And most of that has to do with secret codes between the two people. And the codes can do, be to do with the, the words that people use, their body language, even the time between emitting any sort of signal, like a cough. Listen, I, I did something Why does Ronnie you. suddenly say Cigarette. go here? Cigarette. Um, go. Like, okay. Okay, now Why I'm does he ignore the presenter's instruction to ask what one man has in his pocket? Orange. Yeah. This is terrific. So, uh, well, what, one second. Okay. Keith, what's his name? The audience could be invited to suggest controls. Like somebody in the audience could put his hand up and say, make the father not shout out anything to the son. Make the father stay completely silent. Now that in itself might be enough to completely spoil the trick. And that would be, I think, good entertainment. Even if it wasn't good entertainment, I think it should be done. The television producers will sometimes say, oh, you couldn't do that. We'd just lose all the viewers. We'd lose all, all the ratings. I'm afraid that's just too bad. They should. Get your free 10 minutes now from Psychic Readers Network. Get the free time you need. Now, I heard you saying before you thought you had a fantastic reading. He gave me a lot of insight on career opportunities in the future. The psychics we are most likely to encounter today tell us not what's in someone's pocket, but what we can expect in our lives. Actually told me some good things about it. This kind of psychic hotline promotion is common on television in America. People are invited to phone in for personalized psychic readings. Such readings are likely to use a technique called cold reading, which makes you feel that generalized statements relate specifically to your life. But isn't all this just harmless fun, even therapeutic? Mark Paul's experience suggests otherwise. He's a magician who read about cold reading techniques in conjuring literature and booked himself a stall at a psychic fair. Someone can sit down and I can assess their character. I can look at them, I can look at the way they sit, I can look at the way uh, they hold their hands, I can look at the way that they react to certain questions. And by reading the information that they're giving back to me, I can give them an accurate character reading about themselves and sometimes the accuracy is quite amazing. Anyone can read a manual on cold reading and amaze complete strangers. You appear to be a highly emotional type of person. At one moment you're at the height of elation and the next deep in despair. As a consequence you do really love life. 
As Mark Paul's day at the psychic fair progressed, he realized that he was getting into deeper and deeper water. They want details, they want to hear information about themselves. And it's easy to give that information, but when it comes down to specifics like, you know, what's my baby going to be like, is it going to be healthy, so on, uh, the morality of the whole thing just hit me really hard. I mean, I, I went in a sinner and came away a saint. I just couldn't do it. Some may find solace in spurious psychic readings and lose only their money. But so-called psychic surgeons can seriously damage your health. Richard Wiseman went to investigate Rubens de Faria, visiting from Brazil, who had made a makeshift operating theatre in a Mayfair public library. He was claiming that whatever your illness, he could make a small but real cut into your stomach and release the bad spirits. He was making real incisions, uh, not deep incisions, but real ones. There was blood over the instruments, blood over his hands. He was moving from one patient to the next without washing his hands, sterilizing the instruments. We are thinking in a medieval fashion. Now we've gone back to superstition and mythology, and we're embracing it all. If in this country we can have the Tinkerbell White House, as I refer to it, where Ronald Reagan is actually depending upon the wisdom of an astrologer in San Francisco, in order to direct his personal life and affairs of state, I seriously think that this is a bad situation in which we find ourselves. If, for example, uh, somebody goes to a psychic and they feel better afterwards, or if, as we know, people who believe in life after death are in some ways happier and, and better adjusted than people who don't, isn't it then wrong for scientists to come along and say, well, you know, I, science says death's the end and life's meaningless? Um, well, I think not, honestly. In the end, I think I would always rather go for truth as far as we can find it in science and hope that we can learn to cope with it. True science is wonderful. True science is deeply mysterious, but we're working on explaining it. There could be evidence which one day will show that something that we would now think of as magical or paranormal is true, but there's no reason at all to think that it will be those particular rather poverty-stricken ideas that happen to be floating around at the moment and call the paranormal. James Randi's Educational Foundation is offering a prize of $1.1 million to anyone who can prove a genuine psychic phenomenon under controlled conditions. The front door of this foundation is just around the corner here, and we can hear if anyone knocks on the door or rings the bell. Would you not think, with all of the psychic powers that are being practiced every day by all of these psychics all around the world, and particularly here in the United States of America, that there wouldn't be a lineup outside that door of people trying to win the $1.1 million? We don't get anyone applying for it. This coming Tuesday night, Night Watch discusses the power of psychics. That's at 10 past midnight.